As you know, I'm going to speak to you today about poetry and uh, how it has affected me personally and why I believe it's important for all of us. So why poetry? Poetry is the essence of language, and language is the mirror of the soul. Poetry is able to deliver with just a few lines the full range of human experience. That, of course, is the art of poetry and why it is so difficult to write well. When we were growing up as kids, my father used to read to us in the evenings, and a lot of it was poetry. He also used poetry as a punishment. <laughs> Whenever we committed a misdemeanor, we had to memorize a poem and recite it in front of the family before dinner. <laughs> now, I was one of what you called back then a difficult child, and so I learned a lot of poetry. <laughs> After a while, he said, well, you can select a poem of your own choosing. Has to be more than a few lines, of course. And being contrary by nature, I was determined to find poetry that he wouldn't recognize. Not easy, because he uh, was well read, but his poetry stopped at Eliot and Pound. And so I was able to go on and find poets like Wallace Stevens, uh, Allen Ginsberg, uh, Ferling Getty, Irving Layton, and many others. I remember memorizing a poem about the Great Depression, something he had lived through. This poem by E.E. E. Cummings paints or illustrates vividly the hardships of that time. Note the the change of tense in the last sentence, which kicks the poem up into a higher registry. It really must be nice never to have no imagination, or never to wonder about them guys you used to, and them slim hot queens with damn next to nothing on, tangoing, while a feller tries to hold down the 50 bucks per job with one foot and rock the cradle with the other. It must be nice never to wonder about why you put the ring on, watching your face grow old and tired to which you're married, and hands get red, washing things and dishes. And to never really wonder, I mean about the smell of babies, and how you know the damn rent's going to, and to never, never, never stand at no window because I can't sleep, smoking sawdust cigarettes in the middle of the night. That last line and to never, never, never stand at no window because I can't sleep smoking sawdust cigarettes in the middle of the night. For the first time in my life, I made an impression on my father, something that left a mark on both of us, I think. With the recitation of that poem, I'd grown up, and he recognized it. Nevertheless, I was shipped off to boarding school. <laughs> a beat him up, keep him cold type of place. It was run by a... <clears throat> it was run by a Victorian headmaster who was inspiring in both the classroom and on the playing fields. He, he could make ancient history come alive. He also could draw a map of Canada on the blackboard freehand with every major inlet included all perfectly in proportion. He'd come into the classroom with a book of poetry and read Tennyson's Ulysses, slam the book shut and then say, listen to this, listen to it. And he'd recite the whole poem off by heart. But it was not until I came here to Bishops in the late 1950s and met uh, Professor Arthur Motier that I was truly transformed by the power of poetry. There were only six of us in his class, um, and we sat there 
waiting for him to arrive. And suddenly he burst into the door 10 minutes late with his gown flowing behind him, his hair, what little he had, uncombed, and his shirt half unbuttoned. And he wheeled around and said to us, when I was a windy boy in a bit, in the black spit of the chapel fold, sighed the old ramrod, dying of women. I tiptoed shy in the gooseberry wood. The rude owl cried like a tell-tale tit. I skipped in a blush as the big girls rolled, nine pin down on the donkey's common. And on seesaw Sunday nights I wooed whoever I would with my wicked eyes. The whole of the moon I could love and leave, all the green-leaved little weddings' wives in the cold black bush and let them grieve. He went on to recite all five verses of Dylan Thomas's lament. And then he walked across the room, collapsed into a chair, and sat staring out the window which seemed for a very long time. <laughs> and then he turned to us and he said, I'd have given anything to have written that poem. <laughs> well, the interesting thing about Dylan Thomas's poetry, I find, is that he uses combinations of words which under scrutiny don't seem to make sense. But when they're combined in the verse, they actually supercharge the meaning. Dylan Thomas is able to make music with words, words that reach beyond definition into imagination. I decided right then and there that I was going to take every one of Professor Mochier's courses for it, it, it appeared to me that poetry would be something that would last and be more powerful and go beyond and survive a future career in business, midlife crisis, and the growing demands of family life. When I left university, the realities of life left me with little time for poetry. And it wasn't until many, many years later that I, after my business was sold, I was out of a job, that I faced a true change in life. I, I decided that I would fly a small plane, as Peter said, to Africa and spend two and a half years there working for the flying doctors. And it was on those long solo flights that I rediscovered the joy of reciting poetry. It was, you might say, a taproot back into memory. And when I returned to Canada, to my dismay, I found that poetry for the public had really fallen out of fashion. With a few exceptions, it was no longer taught in the schools. It was seldom read and almost never recited. It was as if poetry had receded back into a fringe activity. By contrast, in the States, poetry seemed to be vibrant with, with poets like John Ashbery, Billy Collins, Adrian Rich, and so many others. And in other places in the world, poetry seemed to be alive and well, especially places like Latin America or Eastern Europe. There were public poetry readings that were attended by large and enthusiastic audiences. I remember being on a business assignment to Romania and traveling north to a small town called Yash on the Russian border. And there I counted five public statues to Romanian poets. Romanians revere their poets. And as far as I could make out, 
Everyone I met could recite their poetry. It was as if Canada had let fall away something the rest of the world valued. And this and a fierce love of poetry led to the motivation of founding the Griffin Poetry Prize. I was at a dinner party with Margaret Atwood and Michael Ondaatje, a former bishop student here, and David Young. And we decided then to form the Griffin Trust for Excellence in Poetry to promote poetry around three important principles. The first was to establish a poetry prize that would be large enough that it would make a statement. A statement that declared that poetry was just as important as fiction and nonfiction. And secondly, that the trustees would all come from a literary background. Margaret Atwood, Carolyn Fourche, Robert Haas, Michael Ondaatje, Robin Robertson, and David Young. And thirdly, and most importantly, that the prize would be both international as well as Canadian. We all agreed that we would invite and encourage translations. Controversial decision, because how could translations possibly compete with the original? And yet, in the first year, a translation won the international prize. And this year, with over 500 books of poetry submitted, we have translations into English from more than 29 different languages. And as Peter has mentioned, uh, in order to redress the lack of poetry in the schools, the Trust decided to form a Canadian bilingual competition for students, um, which is called Poetry and Voice, or Les Voix de la Poésie. This is a competition where students have to recite poetry by, by memory in front of judges and a paying audience with only a microphone on the stage. It was inspired by a, an American version called Poetry Out Loud, designed to introduce the beauty of language to students, while at the same time instilling a sense of confidence for them from public speaking. And as Peter again said, part of my speech, uh, there are 177 schools competing this year from every province in Canada. Well, these initiatives have helped somewhat to raise the profile of poetry in Canada, but really, it's just a beginning. We need to spread over a wider public an appreciation of the power and beauty of the written and spoken word through poetry. We all need to read poetry. And when we come across a beautiful line, to commit it to memory. This is, this is the best way to understand, truly understand, a poem, short of having written it. This one act can help enhance and enrich our lives. And so I come to the last poem. It's an old chestnut, but a good one. Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. A poem I memorized here, not more than 200 feet from this theater, under the pines beside the old library 57 years ago. The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full. The moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast, a light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand, glimmering and vast, out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet as the night air. Only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon-blanched land, listen. You hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling. At their return, up the high strand, begin and cease, and then again begin 
with tremulous cadence slow and bring the eternal note of sadness in. Sophocles heard it once upon the Aegean and it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also a thought hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once too at the full, and round her shores lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind on the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. All oh, love, let us be true to one another, for this world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams so various so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor peace, nor hope, nor certitude for pain. And we are here as on a darkling plain, swept by confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. So there you have it. All the arts, whether it be music, dance, Painting or poetry define our humanity. But the greatest of these, for me, is poetry.